Good afternoon. My name is Stephen McRae. Thank you so much for attending today's Democratic Congressional Candidate Debate here at Eastern Washington University. I am the president of the Eastern Washington University Student Democrats. I am a junior here at Eastern Washington University. I am also the president of the Eastern Washington University Student Democrats. I am currently a precinct committee officer in the 6th Legislative District of Eastern Washington for the Democratic Party. I am an elected water commissioner for District 10 of Spokane County, and I'm a recently appointed member of the Governor's Committee on Disabled Issues and Employment for Washington State. I first would like... I would like to thank our candidates for agreeing to being here this afternoon. All three of our candidates, Dr. Bernadine Bank, Carmela Conroy, and Anne-Marie Danimus, are amazing women, and we are very fortunate to have all of them running for, to represent us, represent us in the People's House. In November of 2022, I began my studies here at Eastern Washington University, and I discovered the absence of any political clubs on our campus. As a Democrat, I found this to, absence to be personally troubling. I believe that educational institutions are ideal environments for learning how to participate in political discourse. With this in mind, I set out to create the Student Democrats here at Eastern. With the help of many individuals, we started the Student Democrats last spring. In the past year, the officers of our club have worked hard to found the club and to the point that we have today and to be able to offer events as we are this afternoon. Much of the work that we have done over the last year has involved such fun things as writing bylaws, <laughs> recruitment, and fundraising. This is our first official event. We hope to offer many more such events in the future. To this point, we will need your help. As you have noticed at the front table, I have been asking folks to donate. We are not charging for this event, so your donations are essential for us to be able to continue to offer events like this. Now I'd like to thank some of our members who have contributed their ideas and time and energy to the planning of, of this event. First, I'd like to ask Kira Condon, would you please stand? <laughs> Kira has worked very hard and given many hours to planning today's event. Without her efforts, I do not believe that we would be able to offer this event this afternoon. Kira will be will be graduating this spring from the political science department. We will miss her, but we are very excited to see what she will be doing with her life. Yeah. Next, I would like to thank our secretary, Tavita Fakasaiki. Tavita was one of our first members to join and he has been an essential member ever since we founded the club. Everything that we have done, every event that we have planned, every time that we have hosted a register to vote table, Tavita has made himself available to us. Tavita is the one that designed our logo, and he has been an essential member of our club. <laughs> Next, I would like to recognize our treasurer, Johnny Curtis. Johnny was also one of our original members that joined us this spring, or sorry, last fall. He has been there at every one of our meetings when he has been asked, and we are very appreciative of him today being our timer. I would also like to thank Chris Poe, Anna Chavez, and Luke Zager.
Now I'd like to introduce our moderator this afternoon, Tim Harrington. Tim is a non-traditional student here at Eastern Washington University. Tim will be graduating with honors this spring with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and History. While at Eastern Washington University, Tim was responsible for the Frontier Justice Digitizing Project at the Eastern Branch of the Washington State Archives. He has also served as at the Eastern Washington University chapter of Phi Alpha Theta History, Honor Society, and the History Club. Ladies and gentlemen, our moderator, Tim Harrington. Thank you, Stephen, for that introduction. Uh, just a warning that my sinuses are starting to affect me with the seasonal change, so please bear with me. Uh, I will now welcome each candidate with their own prepared introductions in alphabetical order. <clears throat> Dr. Bernadine Bank. Dr. Bernadine Bank is an obstetrician slash gynecologist focusing on women's health, veterans' rights, and the well-being of working families in Eastern Washington. Though she is well known as Dr. Bank, many of her friends and family know her simply as Bernie. Bernie was born into a solid working class family in Joliet, Illinois, and is the youngest of 10 children. Her father was a machinist and her mother a school teacher. Her brothers and sisters worked as firefighters, carpenters, nurses, and musicians, all raising families of their own. Bernie went to both public and Catholic schools. She spent time in Australia as an exchange student and eventually worked her way through college and medical school. Bernie then became Dr. Bank. Dr. Bank's career took her to Dallas and into a successful private practice, but after 19 years, it was time for a change. She chose the move to Colbert because it was the right place for her family to settle down. She then took a couple of years off to focus on raising her children. In 2009, Dr. Bank returned to medicine at the Community Health Association of Spokane. And in 2016, due to her medical expertise and leadership skills, she was selected to start up the first gyne gyne sorry, gynecology department at the Spokane VA. Today, her advocacy for veterans and accessible health care is well known at that institution. Dr. Bank is a political centrist who identifies as a Democrat. The Dobbs decision has attacked women's health and their democratic principles, making them second-class citizens. The current tenuous state of women's health in our nation is the primary motivation for her candidacy. Though dedicated to fighting for women's rights, Dr. Banks' platform also emphasizes a strong, dynamic America. She supports small business owners, farmers, green energy growth, enhanced infrastructure, and economic revitalization. Her campaign is not just about holding the line, it's about taking action on long neglected infrastructure projects, ensuring equitable agricultural policies, providing reliable veterans health care, and safeguarding our environment and natural resources. Dr. Bank is running for Congress, and she's running for women's health. She invites the community to join her dedicated team of volunteers and host gatherings to be part of her vision for a prosperous and inclusive future. Carmela Conroy. Carmela Conroy, sorry. Carmela Conroy, Conroy was born and raised in Spokane and the Spokane Valley. She was active in 4-H, band, debate, and student government. She, her brother, and sister all graduated from Central Valley High School. After graduating high school, Carmela worked her way through college and law school at the University of Washington. Her brother attended Spokane Community College and the University of Idaho. Her sister graduated Eastern Washington University with a degree in radio and TV. Carmela moved home to serve as a deputy prosecutor for Spokane County, holding accountable dangerous drivers, violent offenders, and seeking justice for victims of sexual assault. Carmela then joined the U.S. Foreign Service and represented our country while two Republican and two Democratic presidents were in office. She studied counterinsurgency at the U.S. Naval War College, earning a Master, Master of Arts with highest distinction in national security studies. She lived in Afghanistan during its first presidential election, in Pakistan before and after the U.S. military killed Osama bin Laden, in Norway, a NATO ally bordering Russia, when Russia invaded Ukraine's Crimean Peninsula, in Japan when the COVID-19 pandemic started in neighboring China. After nearly 30 years of public service, she's running for office because Congress is being held hostage by extremists whose political games are restricting our freedoms, failing working class people, and threatening our survival as a species. 
Carmelo believes we must change this, and if we can, and if we can, if we vote Democrat. Carmela has always called Eastern Washington home. She understands how the federal government works, and she wants to put it to work to solve our common, common challenges. She is working to become our next congressional representative in Eastern Washington. She is looking forward to hearing from the Eastern Washington University community. Finally, Anne Marie Danimus. Anne Marie Danimus is a blue collar Democrat fighting to bring opportunity back, leaving no one behind. Her campaign is a vision of prosperity for all Americans. This vision begins with her fight for universal health care, climate action, public education, rural development, and strong unions. She is the first disabled candidate to run for this office, having survived a double transplant, and will put special focus on the disabled, veterans, and senior citizens by eliminating the roadblocks to proper care. Anne Marie's work experience has been split between her marketing firm, which specializes in small business development and community organizing. Starting her activism at age 12, she has an impressive nonprofit resume, which includes environmental causes like helping the WAPERGs to pass the ban on F oh, CFCs, fundraising to build several schools, and the first domestic violence shelter in the state of Jalisco, Mexico, as well as volunteering with two animal rescue groups. She co-organized the counter-protest in support of Drag Queen Story Hour, was on a homeless outreach team, and has sponsored several food drives. She has been on several nonprofit boards, is the current chair of the 4th LD Democrats, and was the president of Amnesty International in her junior year at WSU, where she graduated from the honors program with a BA in communications. Anne Marie is a professional singer, actor, writer, and director. She is the executive director and founder of the nonprofit Stubborn Girl Fund for Arts and Education, which produces artistic projects to educate the public on social issues. The slogan is, changing the world, one story at a time. Anne Marie is not a career politician and refuses to take a penny from corporate PACs or lobbyists. She created the NOPE Pledge, which stands for Not One Penny Ever. Her parents raised her to help those who cannot help themselves, and their guidance is the driving force behind her personal mantra, do good. Let's hear it for our candidates. Okay, before the uh, first question, we're just going to go over the rules one more time to make sure not only the candidates remember, but the audience as well. Uh, candidates will be, allowed, we will be allotted three minutes to answer each question and a minute and a half for an optional rebuttal. We will have 15 prepared questions from student clubs, professors, and other students. If time allows, we will move into other prepared questions or go back to a question that both the candidates and audience feel needed more time. If time allots, we will also be taking questions from the audience, which they will write down as they come into the debate, and we will look through, through as to not have any repeat or irrelevant questions. Uh, we expect this debate to go for about 70 to 90 minutes. There are also two colored paddles to my right. Um, when a candidate has 10 seconds left, there will be a, or the, of the three in a lot of time, a yellow paddle will be held up. When their time is up, a red paddle will be held up, and a candidate is expected to stop in a timely manner. By that, I mean finish your sentence and be done. Um, <laughs> now, I've also been told that there is a mute button off to the side, so uh, it, I do have backup. Uh, so um, just keep that in mind. Um, candidates do not need to use the entire three minutes to answer questions if they feel they have sufficiently answered. Um, we had a card drawing in the back for um, the order. This will be a round robin, so um, the same person will not be answering first uh, in successive questions. Um, okay, afterward, at, at the end of the debate, it will be five minutes for each candidate to speak freely about themselves or anything they want. Following the debate, there will be a 30-minute meet and greet where candidates can speak to people directly. Now, this is just a reminder. They, uh, our candidates know this, but there is to be no fundraising allowed on stage. Um, no, ask, no asking to contribute to a campaign, no QR codes, uh, and nothing like that. So um, just to make sure that's clear, uh, that we'll have to call that out if I hear it. So it's against the rules of the university. So, Okay, uh, without further ado, let's get going. So with the, the order we have here is uh, Dr. Bank, Ms. Conroy, and then Ms. Danimus. So the first question will go to Dr. Bank first. Why are you the best candidate? For this position. Uh, 
As a physician, I have developed the skills of being a good listener and a collaborator. Physicians listen to patient issues, form an assessment with additional research if needed, and then present options of treatment or possible interventions, making the patient a collaborator in the decision-making process. This is how I plan to approach the constituents of Congressional District 5. Most voters care about nonpartisan issues like having high quality education for their children, access to good health care, uh, supporting veterans, good paying jobs, affordable housing, clean water, and a healthy environment. This election year has the biggest human rights concern of our time with reproductive freedom and women's health on the ballot. I will fight and use my strong background in science and medicine to improve the quality of life for all Americans. Ms. Conroy. Thank you. My name's Carmela Conroy. I'm a third generation Inland Northwesterner. I'm a third generation union worker. And I've spent 30 years in nonpartisan public service, first as a deputy prosecutor here in Spokane County for, for four years, and then almost 25 years as a diplomat, a foreign service officer with the US Department of State. During that time, I worked for presidents of both parties. And I worked for leaders who understood that whatever we did as government employees, it had nothing to do with partisanship. Our job as government employees was to solve problems for people. If we only talked about them and didn't do anything to solve them, we were just admiring the problem, and that wasn't good enough. Tom Foley was the ambassador to Japan when I worked at Embassy Tokyo, and he really stressed the importance of our constitutional duty to uphold the Constitution and support the, the organizations established under that Constitution. I've never voted any place but in Spokane, even when I served overseas. No place else in the world has been home, even though I've lived abroad um, in service of our country. I understand how deeply the current dis dysfunction in Washington, D.C. is affecting all of us and how much worse it could become. It is looking almost certain that Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee for president this fall. And that the Republican Party, although it, like the Democratic Party, had common goals to expand democracy and promote an inclusive economy, is no longer doing that. It is working to restrict our freedoms, it is failing working class people, and it is threatening our survival as a species. By reversing Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court, for the first time in our history, snatched back an individual constitutional right to privacy, allowing the government to regulate whether we have kids, whether we use birth control, and even who we marry if we choose to marry. Restrictive abortion laws in other states are making girls and women's lives, risking girls and women's lives, and they are straining a healthcare system that we all need. We can change this. And we can if we vote for Democrats. The Republican Party is failing working class people, anyone who relies on their labor to live, and we are losing ground to the extremely wealthy because federal taxes fall too heavily on labor while leaving capital practically untouched. We must change this, and we can, if we vote for Democrats. And finally, scientists tell us that oceans are, are surging to record-breaking levels of warmth, risking our survival, we must change this, and we can if we vote for Democrats. Thank you, Ms. Conroy. Ms. Stanimus. Thank you. Uh, the reason that I would be the best choice to be your new Congresswoman is because my campaign is founded on a vision of prosperity for everyone. We are lacking vision. And for far, far too long, this congressional district has lacked true leadership. Now, if you own a very big corporation, then maybe you may have been satisfied over the last 20 years. But for the everyday working people of this district, they're struggling. I understand that struggle. 
Uh, I grew up in a working class household which graduated to the middle class because my dad became a union worker. Unions built the middle class. And now they say the American dream is dead. I don't think we lack the dreams. What I think we lack is the opportunity to make those dreams a reality. And it really doesn't matter where you look, where you're from, or who you are. If you're not a multimillionaire, there is some level of struggle that you are dealing with. For the young people in this audience, it could be just the struggle of the tremendous amount of debt that they will face once they graduate school. Uh, for our senior citizens in the audience, if they don't have any other form of income, so many senior citizens, almost 50% that rely on Social Security, live in poverty. If you're disabled, like myself, and have gone through a tremendous medical struggle, like I did through my double transplant, it left me financially destitute. These are stories that used to be, oh gosh, I know someone who knows someone. Now it's all of us or someone in our family. A vision of prosperity starts with a better regulation, with better government. You know, so many times when we talk about struggles and we all can kind of agree, like we all know there's a housing crisis, and I'm talking Democrats and Republicans. We all know that there's problems with our health care system. But how can we expect to reach across the aisle if we don't start reaching across the street. It's important that we choose a candidate in the primary that can reach across the street, that can touch people and communicate with them on the base level of their struggle, and to show them and guarantee them that we are listening to them too. Because I don't think we'd have a tremendous amount of disagreements in this room about what Democrats want. But there is a struggle to bring back what all Americans want. And I am the girl to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Danis. So the, uh, you all have an option for uh, rebuttal, even if that is an introductory uh, statement. Um, but I do want to identify that that question came from uh, Dr. James Headley, a uh, political science professor at Eastern. Um, Dr. Bank, did you want to rebut any of this? No. Uh, Ms. Conroy? No, thank Ms. you. Ms. Danimus? OK. So question number two. We're going to start with Ms. Conroy this time. Um, this question comes from Eastern Washington's Native American Student Association. How are you actively supporting and listening to indigenous people, and why have these processes not been happening until now? I'll start with you, Ms. Conroe. Thank you. I am working to reach out both to urban indigenous people as well as to the tribes. I've spoken with folks at the, the Native Health Project and um, with other groups in, in private conversations. Part of the reason that the federal government hasn't grappled with indigenous people's issues has been lack of attention. I think that the Biden administration's appointment of Secretary Deb Holland as the first indigenous person and the first woman to lead uh, the Bureau of the Interior is a huge step forward for addressing longstanding injustices <clears throat> in denying indigenous people the royalties that the federal government owes them for extractive industries and timber work and, and running cattle and other benefits that, that renters derive from indigenous lands that have not been passed back to the people who own those lands. And I will be striving to make sure that the indigenous people in our community, in our district, whether they're on the reservation or, or in urban areas, get the, the sovereign rights that are due to them. Ms. Danimus. Thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to acknowledge that we all stand on land that did not belong to us. Um, but it, we need more than acknowledgement, we need action. 
the first thing that we have to do, the most important thing, is we have to start standing by our word. I am a person that says what she means and means what she says, and I expect the same from my country. The amount of treaties that have been ignored or changed at will without even a conversation or a negotiation with the tribes that they were first negotiated with is a slap in the face to the people who have been the caretakers of this, uh, of this beautiful land that we now call America and who made their way here without our help for a very, very long time. Um, first and foremost, obviously, what is certainly an issue in this district is the salmon industry. You know, we have been just giving them money, but this is a job and a cultural, it's a jobs program. It is uh, an economic, uh, I just went blank. It's an econ, it's a, it's a vital part of their economy. That's what I want to say, uh, as well as their culture. And so we have to make sure that we were honoring these, uh, these treaties that we have made with Native people. The Treaty of Akota, of New Akota, which was supposed to guarantee them a seat in the House of Representatives. This was ages ago, and they still do not have representation. It should not just be us three white women promising to listen. They should be able to have a seat of their own. Um, in addition to that, missing and murdered indigenous people is at a crisis level. I have been talking with Don Pullen, who is the coordinator with, uh, with the Spokane County Police Department uh, between the tribes and the police. Uh, the Violence Against Women Act made a little bit of room where we would actually assist in these because oddly enough, it is not people, indigenous people that are disappearing from reservations, from tribal land. It is urban areas. And as people of color, they have been ignored by law enforcement. And it's not just women either, it is men too. These are huge issues that are facing Native Americans and they are very tied to the environment. We, we have to listen, but we also have to start taking real action. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Beck. Thank you. So any support uh, with, starts with dialogue in, in any relationship, and in this case, listening to each tribe and its elders. Uh, I think we sometimes forget that the Native American tribes are not a monolith. They're each separate sovereign nations. Um, and so you really have to reach out to each sovereign nation to understand what their issues are. Uh, as a state committee member for the Spokane County Democrats, I attend as many of the Native American caucus meetings as I can at the, at the state level, and that's been quite eye-opening for me. And on a local level, I've been meeting with members of the Spokane tribe to understand their issues and needs. And I, of course, plan to continue to meet with other tribes in the area uh, as time goes forward. I suspect that, like many of our rural co uh, communities, that a lot of the tribes need more broadband and internet access uh, and better health care issues uh, and, and need some of their health care clinics boosted. But I think it's wrong to come in with any assumptions because some communities probably have those issues covered. So I think the way to support is by being a good listener. And then once there might be uh, a, a situation where the federal government could be supportive or, or be helpful, then make sure that that collaboration can go forward. Uh, for instance, the Midnight Mine up in um, the Spokane, Spokane Reservation, that collaboration with the EPA has actually been very beneficial and positive for the Spokane tribe. And uh, one of the elders told me recently that by 2028, they will have those grounds cleaned up to the level where you can put a daycare on that land. Um, so 
I'm thrilled that that's the word coming back, that they're very happy with that result. And I think uh, there's other opportunities, uh, but again, it's kind of up to each, each community if, if these are things they really need and help with housing, healthcare, forest management, job creation, uh, small business support, or anything of that nature. And I think uh, it's, it's gonna be a two-way relationship uh, based on trust and respect. Thank you. Ms. Conroy, would you like a rebuttal? No, thank you. Ms. Danimus? Um, I don't have a rebuttal per se, but I would like to acknowledge something that uh, Dr. Banks said, and that is that each tribe is not, uh, that Native Americans are not a monolith. And, you know, I mentioned the Treaty of New Dakota. They actually have a Congress of their very own. And a lot of Americans don't realize that where they come together and discuss these important issues. So they are working on their own, but they are also Americans and it's time we incorporate uh, their desires, their needs, their thoughts, their economic uh, needs into our system. Under the 14th Amendment section one, they have equal protection under the law and we are not satisfying that. Thank you. Dr. Bank? Um, it's not really a rebuttal, it's just a comment. And I just think it's really exciting that some partnerships are forming in the community. Uh, for instance, between the Inland Northwest Conservancy and the Spokane Tribe, uh, a large tract of land was purchased called Glentana, a thousand plus acres. And the Spokane Tribe will have two miles of riverfront property for salmon restoration. And I think these kinds of uh, local and statewide collaborations are gonna be wonderful and I hope we can keep that momentum going and keep those things going forward. Thank you very much. The next question comes from the EWU Black Student Union. And we're gonna start with Ms. Danimus. What platform do you plan on giving healthcare and social services to people in Spokane? Specifically, how do you plan to boost proactive support and maternal care for African-American women? Yes. Um, Healthcare is a huge part of my platform, having survived a double transplant. And the lack of care and the level of prejudice in healthcare towards people of color, especially African American women, women is absolutely just heartbreaking. Absolutely heartbreaking. Their maternal. Um, their maternal mortality rate is almost 10 points higher than it is for white women. Um, I watched the protests with regards to uh, treatment of police and talking about Black Lives Matter. And as you read through the statistics, and I know my own personal struggles with healthcare, I often wondered why we weren't gathering in front of hospitals and demanding that they make black lives matter as much as white lives. And I think that uh, with regards to healthcare, especially in inequality, uh, we have disabled people, we have uh, senior citizens, we have people of color, uh, Native Americans, and also rural Americans. And part of the reason for this is that we have a pay to play system. It is your money or your life. And because of the way that the economy has been structured in the United States going back to its creation, uh, if you are someone who has been treated as less in life, that only creates a domino effect and it runs right through healthcare and almost any system where the federal government plays a part. Um, if we can remove the profit margin, create a base level of health care in the United States, that means that an area that is affected by poverty will still have the same amount of resources available because that would be the standard of care. 
not how much money can be gained from a particular community. So I think that um, it's unfortunate that so many of these issues stem back to money. And it is part of the reason that I've made the pledge not to take a penny of corporate money. Because between pharmaceutical companies and private insurance companies, African American people, other people of color are fighting so on so many levels now we also have to fight for health care. It's something that is often an afterthought, but it is so important because it is taking lives. And I will make that a huge priority once I become your next Congresswoman. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bank. The non-Hispanic black maternal mortality rate in this country is 2.6 times the rest of the country. That is shocking and shameful. To address this, I think we definitely need to provide more access to prenatal care and postpartum care. Uh, that is really one of the biggest issues. Um, obviously, maternal mortality uh, has to have uh, oversight and, and, and to make sure those things don't happen because things can go south pretty fast in a pregnancy and postpartum too. So I think as, uh, it, it, the lucky thing for me is I work at the CHAZ Clinic, the Community Health Association, Association, Association of Spokane. And uh, in that clinic, we have something called First Steps. And First Steps is available for both uh, uh, supplemental infant care and maternal care for the whole first year of life of that infant. And that program is such a strong uh, uh, support for social and medical needs uh, for all of the underserved in our community. So one of the things I would definitely encourage going forward is that communities throughout the United States have more organizations like First Steps. Thank you. Ms. Conroy. Thank you. The first thing that I would do would be to fight with the rest of the Democrats in the House of Representatives to establish a nationwide restoration of the right to reproductive health that as an individual choice rather than something that government decides for us. That would be so important in, in addressing um, black people's health as well as everybody else's. I would also work to expand universal health care under Democratic administrations, when there's been a Democratic majority in the House of Representatives, we've been able to bring millions and millions of Americans access to health so that they can get, get their needs treated, um, regardless of what their income is. The third thing that I would do is make sure that there is equity in investing in health research, especially with respect to um, maternal health and, and maternal mortality. Without racial and gender equity in, in research, both theoretical as well as applied research, to make sure that everybody has access to the care that suits their needs, uh, we will go on to have a situation where, as, as Bernie and Amory have pointed out, People of color f have far worse health outcomes than white people, uh, almost regardless of gender, um, or sorry, reg regardless of income. So maternal health care is, is extremely important, and I would do all these things to, to provide support to all of us at every stage of life. Thank you, Ms. Conroy. Uh, Ms. Danimus, would you like a rebuttal? Well, I think that part of the reason that we find ourselves in this situation, the primary reason that we find ourselves in this situation is that large corporations that are involved in healthcare, be it uh, insurance providers or pharmaceutical companies, have had the law crafted to their benefit. In a country of we the people, this is a violation of the very foundation of representation. So my not taking corporate money is really the first step. 
and changing these laws so they actually benefit us and not large corporations. I actually believe that's the number one problem in the United States is corporate money and politics. It touches every single issue, not only domestically, but internationally. We have got to get that influence out or none of the ideas that anyone has, good ideas are actually gonna come to fruition. Thank you, Dr. Bank. And I believe the question was, what else can be done to help support uh, people of color in the African American communities in, in the country? So I definitely think we need to encourage uh, uh, loans and or grants to small businesses and uh, also for housing to that community because they have definitely gotten the short end of the stick through many, many years of uh, racism and redlining. Uh, so I think that's just another way. I, I, my heart and soul, of course, is, is health care. And that is probably one of the you know, biggest areas of, of concern for me. And that does impact uh, African Americans uh, across the board. But I also think there's lots of other things that the federal government can be doing to help. And finally, Ms. Conroy. Thank you. Okay, the next question comes from our Student Democrats Club, and it will go to Dr. Bank first. In light of the substantial $34 trillion national debt, what solutions would you propose to alleviate this burden and ensure it does not burden future generations? Fiscal responsibility is tough for Americans. We really like instant gratification. We like to have it now. And we are not very good at saving or putting off for the rainy day. Uh, and so we are on track now to straddle our future generations with huge debt. And that uh, we need to be thinking of creative ways to lower the debt. One of our largest expenditures is Social Security. We currently cap income at 168,000 for payment into the Social Security program. If you make more than that, you don't keep paying your 6.2%. Okay, that's not fair. And I'm with the unions and I say scrap the cap, right? We could get a lot more money into the system and it's only fair that people at high income should be paid at least as much. So that is one way to do it. Um, and I really um, think even though it makes logical sense, I don't see it being uh, easy for the country to embrace uh, increasing the age. So I do, not, I do not support that. But if the corporate tax rate is really supposed to be 21%, yeah, and the American, average American is paying 24.8%, and at the end of the day, a lot of these companies aren't paying anything. Uh, General Electric in 2023, uh, had $7 billion in profit, paid zero taxes, and got a refund, right? There's something really wrong with that equation. So we really, really do need to fix the tax code in this country and get rid of a lot of those loopholes for corporations because they should be really paying their fair share. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Conroy. Thank you. There's, there's sort of three overarching things that we need to do. One of them is to ca tax corporate profits at the same rate that we tax individual income from labor, uh, tax individual wealth at the same rate that we tax individual income from labor, and I agree with Bernie, scrapping the cap is part of what we need to do. So working class people, and I mean everybody from ditch diggers or cement masons like my grandpa, railroaders like my dad, or doctors or lawyers and professionals, any of us who earn a living by the hours that we put into our job, we are all working class people. And a lot of the ways that we talk about workers, it's intended to divide us up so that we don't show solidarity with one another. And so labor solidarity, which includes all of us who don't get to rely on an inherited trust fund, is what we need to do in order to bring tax fairness and revenue fairness back in the government. Um, we know that 
the corporate tax rate, the taxes on corporate profits are far lower than it is on individual income. And we also know that there's a lot of tax cheating that goes on. About every dollar that we put into enforcement through the IRS brings us back $12 in return by cracking down on people who and corporations that are avoiding paying their taxes. Um, the, the Biden um, inflation and infrastructure package provided more, more money to the IRS for enforcement. And in less than a year, they brought in about $150 billion. So that's a drop in the bucket when we're talking about $34 trillion in debt. But you've got to start somewhere. And to me, $150 billion seems like real money. So um, working people under our current system, since the tax cuts that were enacted under the previous guy's administration, um, working class people are definitely subsidizing the wealthy ones. Our health care, food, and housing is unaffordable for the vast majority of us, while corporations enjoy record-breaking profits. We have to change this, and we can do that if we vote for de Democrats, and that's how we bring our national debt back, or our budget back into uh, more of a balance. Thank you. Ms. Danimus. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the fact that in the question they didn't use the word crisis <laughs> because the GOP loves to talk about the debt crisis. And 40 years of trickle-down economics has really been a large contributor to that because we have some of the highest income disparity that we've seen in the history of the nation and definitely over the last 100 years. Um, you know, the taxes that we pay on a regular basis really main, you know, are to guarantee a control of inflation. Um, we will never 100% balance the budget, and I actually think that we should get rid of that. Um, the way that the GOP presents this argument spills into the way that Democrats talk about this argument, and we find ourselves in a dangerous situation there because the stock market is booming. You know, right now the U.S. economy is the strongest in the world, but every day, everyday Americans are still suffering. Their personal economy, their personal debt is really what the crisis is in this country. We have a tremendous amount of people on social services, which is a very large chunk of what we pay every year. And the GOP's solution to that is to rip the tablecloth out from underneath people that are barely standing up. But if we do obviously cut the <laughs> eliminate the cap, I absolutely support that. Um, and start paying people a living wage. This is going to reduce the amount of people that need an ad additional help. We make education more affordable. We make health care more affordable because 41% of Americans have medical debt. Our debt has come down a little bit. I absolutely agree we need to tax, um, not only tax large corporations a larger percentage, but also to eliminate some of the loopholes. Because what happened 40 years ago when they started lowering taxes is they didn't get rid of any of the deductions. And it's why we have over 100 corporations in this country that don't pay any taxes at all. This is a huge problem, and there's a lot of ways to address it. But my first priority is to make sure that everyday American families can balance their budgets. And then we move on to shaping the United States because wealthy people are doing fine. The country is doing fine. It's everyday American families that have a debt crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Danimus. Dr. Bank, would you like a rebuttal? Uh, again, just a comment. I've seen graphs that show that the debt uh, decreases during Democratic administrations and increases during Republican administrations. So vote. <laughs> <clears throat> Ms. Conroy. Ditto. <laughs> Ms. Danimus. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> 
Thank you very much. So uh, this next question is a, is a long one, so pay attention. Uh, we have a question from Amy Bass. Amy is a junior, and she's getting her bachelor's in social work here at EWU. This question regards disability. Although Washington State adheres to policy, policies such as the ADA, Americans with Disability Act, the Washington Law Against Discrimination, and the Fair Housing, Housing Act, we still see people with disabilities encountering many forms of discrimination in our society. People with disabilities face unequal employment opportunities through hiring biases and in interviews, ruling out people with disabilities through initial application screenings justified with other excuses, and the lack of proper accommodations, all leading to higher unemployment rates. They also face unequal educational opportunities as most schools segregate children with disabilities into separate classes, fostering a separation in community and encouraging them to be seen as different. To add, people with disabilities face unequal housing opportunities as a direct result of unequal employment opportunities. As most consequently live in a state of poverty, they're often marginalized into impoverished areas that are far from necessary resources and lack proper housing accommodations. Amy would like to emphasize this to give an understanding that something needs to be done. Amy would like to know, is Washington State doing anything to address these injustices that continue despite our current legislation? And what do you plan to do to support Washington State in alleviating these injustices? Ms. Conroy, we'll start with you. Thank you. The Americans with Disabilities Act is such an important baseline for making sure that everybody in America has access to education, to jobs, to housing, and, and that our economy is fully inclusive, including of, of people with disabilities. Um, it, when I was um, working at, at one of our booths at a community event, I was talking with kids about the American Disability Act, and these were older grade school kids. And I asked them if they knew anything that had happened as a result of the Americans with Disability Act. And they said, no, what? And I said, well, you know, the, the cutouts at the corners at sidewalks so that you can ride a scooter or a bike or, or whatever else so you can cross the street without having to pick your bike up or pick your scooter up. They're like, yeah. I said, well, those didn't exist when I was a kid. Those were put into place to remove barriers to people in, in wheelchairs, but that opened up an opportunity for everybody. And they're like, duh, why wouldn't you? And, and, and they took for granted that there would be access um, like, like a ramp that I would have thought of as a wheelchair ramp, but now to kids is just part of the regular landscape. And making access part of our regular landscape is better than it was when I was a kid. There, there's braille and elevators. There are tracks so that people with, with um, vision, vision problems are able to move around more safely. But we also know that there is severe unemployment, um, um, especially in, in people with, with um, sight difficulties. Um, for people with, with hearing disabilities as, as well as people with mobility issues and remembering that all of us at some point are likely to deal with a disability of some kind as we move through the world. So making sure that the Americans with Disabilities Act is fully enforced and that there is funding available, a federal fund that makes it possible for state and local governments to dip into that so that they've got access to a federal pot of funds to make accessibility possible for folks in the local needs that, that, that match local needs is what I would work on doing in Congress. Thank you. Ms. Danimus. Yes. Um, I'm the first candidate who is disabled that has run for this position. Uh, I've had a double transplant, but also I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at age 14. Um, through my transplant, I had 29 surgeries, three and a half years of dialysis, 10 broken bones, dozens and dozens of seizures. I was in a coma for four days, and I almost died twice. When they d resuscitate you, just little note, it hurts. Um, I have been 
on the end of, <laughs> it's interesting because I've been on both ends of it because I have an invisible disability, but for a while it was very visible when I was waiting for transplant. Um, I have had people be so incredibly rude to me, dismissive, and you know, I, I appreciate the ADA so much, but I really feel like it is held up as, oh, well, look, we've done this on paper, but it really whitewashes the issue. Being disabled in this country, for the most part, is a prescription for poverty. It really is. I was on Medicare, Medicaid, disability, and food stamps. I didn't have the energy to raise my hands over my head to wash my own hair. Um, if your mom's hard of hearing, make sure that she knows you're in the bathtub, by the way, because if you can't get up, that can be messy. We have a million people in this country that are permanently wheelchair-bound, and yet we only a million. And we don't supply any funds to build ramps. You can only make so much money, but if you add that with a disability, it's still poverty level. Yes, we need job opportunities. We need the disability program to actually represent what the real life struggles of people who live with disabilities actually to match that. The entire system is set up to keep you off of it. So we need a reboot from top to bottom because the services that the government provides, if they can actually lift people up to a certain level, they can work. They can live regular lives. They will be able to access things. But there are literally hundreds of thousands of Americans that are homebound because they're disabled. This is incredibly abusive. And I know as someone who has lived it myself, it's not only a priority, but it's something that I'm already working on. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bank. Thank you. Um, so it kind of surprised me to remember that it was President George Bush who enacted the ADA law in 1990. And that's been in place for 34 years. Um, I think we've made a lot of progress. Carmela kind of highlighted a number of the opportunities we have in the community uh, to, to assist uh, individuals with disabilities. But obviously, uh, based on our social workers' comments, there's a long way to go. Um, the sixth legislative district recently had a guest speak at our meeting, and this was uh, Chris Rakedall, who is the superintendent of education. And I think one of the question, one, one part of the question was, what is the state of Washington doing to make things better? And let me tell you, we all need to support this man because. He's doing it, he's doing it in the education system and he's making sure those services come into the schools and he's making sure that um, the educators who assist in, in uh, teaching children with disabilities uh, have the, the support that they need. Um, I have an acquaintance who has four children and two are adopted and um, both have special needs issues. And he said, if the public schools didn't exist, my children would have nowhere to go. So my, I think that for the state of Washington, kudos to having uh, somebody on the side of education continuing to provide the, that kind of support for uh, at least the, the young age group. Thank you. Okay, uh, chance for rebuttal, Ms. Conroy? Yes, thank you. Um, it's obviously a problem, a, a challenge that, that we all face. I would like to mention that um, Senator Patty Cooterer is running for Washington State Insurance Commissioner. That's somebody you should definitely ma match your ballot for. Um, the State Insurance Commissioner doesn't get a lot of attention, but that may be the most important office you've never heard of. So make sure you vote for Patty Cooterer for that. Please also bear in mind that 
of the many uh, attacks by Republicans in Congress on the American, uh, um, not the American Disabilities Act, but, but the Affordable Health Care Act, one of the main things that they try to take away is um, access to care for pre-existing conditions. And for people with any sort of uh, a disability that they've had from birth, they would run out of care from the moment of their birth if the Republicans had their way. So definitely vote Democrat for that reason if for nothing else. Um, I thought I was gonna have a third point, but I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> oh, give blood, American Red Cross. That's the one donation I'm gonna request. <laughs> I'll allow it. Uh, Ms. Danimus. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing that I think we need to do too is we need to educate. Um, I do sit on the Washington State Democrats Disability Caucus as a member. And, you know, if, if you don't know of someone and you haven't seen it, has anyone ever broken their leg? Has anyone broken their arm or just had, you know, a surgery? And how long does it take you to recover? You can't, you know, cook for yourself. You can, maybe you can't drive for yourself. You've got family that comes to help you. You were disabled. You were temporarily disabled. And if you broke your leg, maybe even your doctor wrote you a little prescription for a temporary parking pass. You know, if we start changing the way we look at disability as a setback, a temp some, for some people temporary and some people permanent, then that realization is like, yeah, that time I thought I was Mario Andretti and turned out that I wasn't, got in a car accident. I mean, any time that you have had some kind of physical impairment or if you've helped someone, that's being disabled. Now multiply that for the entirety of your life. And I think this level of education is gonna help us get done the things that we need to get done to help those who need these services. Thank you. Dr. Bank. I just say that education about uh, disabled individuals and their needs is a really important uh, focus also. Okay, uh, hold on to your hats. The next question is from Dr. Ed Burns, Professor of Social Work here at Eastern Washington. Section 502B of the 1961 Foreign Assistance Act explicitly states that, quote, no security assistance may be provided to any country, the government of which engages in a consistent pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights, end quote. Mm -hmm. Senators and representatives may, under this section, pass a resolution requiring the U.S. Department of State issue a report within 30 days about a specific government receiving U.S. security assistance. The Israeli Defense Forces have killed and injured thousands of civilians and have displaced millions of civilians from their homes in Gaza. Will you vote yes on a House resolution requiring a State Department report on human rights violations committed by the Israeli Defense Forces in Gaza? Ms. Danimus? Uh, yes, I absolutely will. But maybe we should have one of those for our own country as well. We carpet bombed Cambodia and Laos. We started a 20-year illegal war in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, I mean, I, I support um, Israel as a state, I support them as an ally, but I support them the way that I support my own country, and that I don't always agree with what they do. And certainly, I mean, we, we were kidnapping children on the border only a few years ago. So, yes, I absolutely would vote for that. And also keep in mind that we are not only supplying uh, weaponry to Israel, we are also supplying it to Hamas because we give money and weapons to Turkey and we give it to uh, other countries that are assisting them. So we are on both sides of that war. It is really time that we start embracing the humanitarian ideals that we claim to stand for. But when it comes to the war machine, I mean, I'm sure you've all heard this, uh, war is business and business is good. 
We spend $515 billion on our defense budget, but the military industrial complex makes $818 billion because when we give money to Israel, that money has to be spent on you with U.S. corporations. There is money behind all of this. So yes, I'll vote for it, but I will also vote to make sure that our own country is keeping its powder clean, so to speak. Because when we point fingers at other people, you know, they say for or pointing back, back at you, this needs to be approached in a global perspective. But yes, I would absolutely vote for that. Dr. Bank. So I would vote, I would support uh, not sending additional aid uh, that's unqualified. Uh, red lines must be enforced. I call for an immediate ceasefire predicated upon the release of hostages. I also believe that Senator Chuck Schumer is right and that the Netanyahu government is no longer tenable. But that doesn't mean Hamas and their terrorist tactics are in any way acceptable. First steps here for that crisis is humanitarian aid, release of all hostages, and a ceasefire. Thank you. Ms. Conroy. Instead of asking the Department of State to produce a report on atrocities by the Israeli Defense Forces, I would I would continue to support the State Department and the CIA pursuing all possible diplomatic um, paths to end the conflict in the Middle East. Um, it is a humanitarian disaster, and um, that has to stop, in, including um, working through the United Nations and other multilateral organizations to get both sides to that conflict to stop killing innocent civilians. Part of the problem, of course, is that neither Benjamin Netanyahu nor, the, nor Hamas believe in a two-state solution. Um, each of them wants to commit genocide against people on the other side of the conflict, and neither of those is, is, is acceptable. I would also focus on reinstating just as quickly as possible American financial support to UNRWA in order to ease the humanitarian crisis of the Palestinians, um, both in Gaza, the West Bank, as well as other parts of the Middle East. And I would also in, do everything possible to expand peace negotiations between Israel and its neighbors so that Israel can stop feeling that it is so insecure in its existence. And I do believe that continuing the conversation with the Saudi uh, leadership to recognize Israel and find a lasting peace in the Middle East is what everybody in the region and beyond needs. Okay, uh, first rebuttal, Ms. Danibus. Um, I obviously agree that diplomacy should always be the first order of the day, but the House of Representatives holds the purse the purse strings. And I think that we have not set standards on the money that we give. Um, I think there's too many backdoor deals going on. I don't 100% trust the State Department uh, to be making decisions that are in the best for humans for humanitarian efforts. I mean, our hands are dirty, and obviously what Israel is doing right now is horrendous, but there needs to be higher standards with regards to uh, rules of engagement, how we assist other countries, and we need to put people first. Am I for Israel? Am I for Palestine? I'm for people. People first. Thank you. Dr. Bank. I second that. In terms of I am for people first, absolutely. That's a great comment. Thank you. Ms. Conroy? Nothing further, thank you. Okay. Our next question is from Paige Hughes. Paige is a senior at Eastern and is majoring in political science. Her question is, gun violence has reached a point of crisis in the United States. 
What would you propose to do to change the impact of gun violence whilst respecting the Second Amendment, starting with Dr. Bank? So given that our regions are so similar, I follow my, take my lead from the senior senator, uh, Democratic senator from Montana, John Tester, and I strongly support strict background checks and enforcement of red flag laws. And also laws that are already in place need to be enforced. And a report came out from 2023 uh, that our uh, gun violence rates are down 9%. And that report suggested the reason is because laws that have been on the books were actually being enforced. So I think we need to keep pushing on that. There are other measures I think that could be worthwhile looking at. Personally, I think every home that has a child 18 years and younger should have it mandated that their guns have to be either locked in a safe or have the safety lock on the gun at all times. And if that is not happening and something untoward happens with that gun, the, the owner has to be held responsible and accountable. Uh, I also think that uh, there should be long wait, longer wait periods for uh, getting a gun. I think that would help, and that would help decrease uh, the, the gun violence, uh, because we know that a large percentage, over 54, well, 54% of gun homicides are actually suicide. And I think having a wait time would really benefit uh, uh, decreasing those numbers. I'm sorry, 56%. Uh, the other thing that could be very beneficial is uh, ha uh, uh, trying to lower the amount of uh, bullets in the, in the magazines. So limit the large capacity magazines. And uh, that's kind of a number of my suggestions for, for helping with uh, gun control. Thank you. Ms. Conroy. Gun violence is a serious crime in the United, is a serious issue in the United States. And I think it's tragic and shameful that the number one killer of children in the United States is gun violence. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. So I, I do believe that one of the first things we would need is a, a nationwide universal back gun, background check with no exceptions for sales within family or gun shows or anything like that. If you're buying a weapon, you need to prove that you haven't been convicted of a violent crime. And there should be federal incentives to make sure that local law enforcement agencies, as well as federal law enforcement agencies, including branches of the military, mandatorily report when people have been convicted of violent crime that would restrict their access to a weapon. We can also provide federal incentives in order for state and, and local authorities to have training on the safe use and handling and storage of weapons so that people who have a legitimate need for a gun and you know somebody out in even in the fringes of Spokane County, you might be four or five hours away from a sheriff's deputy being available to come to help you out if you hear something go bump in the night. So people have a legitimate right to have a weapon and uh, those folks who are there are more of us, more gun owners in the United States than there have ever been in the past. And making sure that all of those folks are as familiar with how to safely handle that weapon um, as we were when our, our parents were coming up is super important. The other thing I would do would be to improve access to behavioral health, including suicide prevention. The 5th Congressional District has a, a higher than national average rate of male suicides and they're successful because we have access to guns. And so making sure that, that people in our community, if they're having some sort of suicidal ideation, have some place to go immediately to seek an alternative to looking down the barrel of their own weapon is something that we need to have, especially for our veterans because we've been at war for so long. Thank you, Ms. Danavis. Yes, I mean, we do certainly have a gun violence problem in this country, but we also just have a regular old violence problem as well. Um, you know, the level of people that have just had enough and they're acting out, they're yelling at people in stores, they are shoving each other, there is road rage. And um, certainly um, I have pointed things that I want to do with regards to gun violence, but I do think that 
you know, the massive income disparity that we have. Uh, Americans have lost buying power. They have lost control of their lives. And one thing that's really important to keep in mind is that Americans as a group, not Dems and Republicans, but Americans, we actually agree on this issue to a very large degree after Sandy Hook. It was the Senate in a filibuster that voted that down. Most Americans wanted that to pass. The majority of Americans agree. And when it comes to, you know, um, long, uh, semi-automatic long guns, only like 7% of Americans even own these guns. So when I look at gun violence specifically, um, it has been voted down time and time and time again to actually do a study. And even if it's not an individual study, an accumulative study is important because you can break gun violence down into several areas. Uh, there's mass shootings, there's accidents, there's suicides, there's murder, like with intent murder. Um, there is guns used in the commission of a crime, even if someone is unhurt, that is gun violence. And then there is gang violence. All of these issues have nuanced solutions. And I don't disagree with any suggestions that have been presented here um, by you know, the other two worthy candidates. But I do think that this is a large issue and it needs to be broken down into smaller issues because people like simple. Let's just ban them. No, let's let everybody have one. Let's give guns to teachers and store clerks and people want a simple answer. But we have to remember that one, we all do want an answer. And I think if we break these problems down and we do some real research, especially from the National Institute of Health, which has been suggested and voted down several times, that we little by little can start making progress in this area. Thank you so much. Dr. Bank, do you have a response or a rebuttal? Well, I would just say that research on uh, gun issues was suppressed for over 20 years in this country and has only come back online in the last few years. So we will see more and more data coming out now. In fact, uh, there's a couple studies, one um, that combined uh, the FBI's data and uh, Boston University's independent study uh, that's pretty impressive and looks at a lot of these issues and, and how effective are some of these measures. I would also say in medicine, um, there's this concept called harm reduction, uh, where you're trying to uh, be proactive about preventing uh, bad things from happening. Um, and so with, when it comes to guns, some of the harm reduction uh, measures that you can take would be to have a gun stored off-site. That's one thing. Separate the gun from the bullets and have them separately stored and locked. Uh, and then, of course, just the basic concepts that I've seen, like, I the uh, guns are sold in the state of Washington, each one with its own safety lock. But I hear people say, yeah, uh, I, I never put it on the gun. I, I threw it in the drawer. So I think we need to be um, use education to explain to people why that's so important to keep these guns locked and safe and away from people who might uh, choose to, to do harm to themselves or others. Thank you, Ms. Conroy. I agree. Uh, past congressional practice of prohibiting the Centers for Disease Control and National Institutes of Health from even studying the issues of how we might better keep ourselves safe from guns was a big mistake, and keeping a strong Democratic majority in Congress is a way to make sure that we can get the data we need to keep ourselves safe. Ms. Danimus? Um, you know, I really think that... Um, collectively, we need to come together on this. When we decided that drinking and driving was a bad thing, there wasn't anyone who disagreed, and we we're allowing a tiny minority of voices to impose themselves on the argument in ways that do not make sense and certainly do not save lives. So I think that forming bipartisan coalitions where, um, you know, Republicans who believe 
in the things that we do believe in uh, are protected somewhat because what's happening is this very small minority is uh, creating uh, an impasse where the majority of the people are no longer represented. And that, of course, is funded by the NRA. Again, I get back to corporate PAC money. But I think that gathering people together and using Mothers Against Drunk Drivers and the way that we attack that social issue is an excellent model for creating the power of we the people to actually make these changes and get these laws passed because the majority of us, Republicans, independents, and Democrats, do believe that these things need to be done. Thank you. Our next question is from Tyler Angel. Tyler is a junior at Eastern and he is majoring in gender and women's sexuality studies. The question, what further actions would you take to protect bodily autonomy in Washington in response to national anti-abortion and anti-trans Backlash, starting with Ms. Conroy. So a, a national law securing our privacy rights would be the way to protect our, our rights here in Washington state as, as well as beyond. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, the women and girls are, are coming from Idaho to access our health clinics here in Washington state in Eastern Washington because they can no longer trust that their doctor can give them the support they need um, to help them through uh, a pregnancy. Um, gender care is being prohibited um, in some of our states, and I've got friends who moved up here from Texas because they could no longer trust that they would be safe in getting the care that they needed to support themselves. I have friends with trans kids who are terrified at the possibility that the this laws that are spreading state by state as a result of the demolition of Roe versus Wade and all of the privacy rights that were implicit in, that, in the Dobbs decision are now under attack. So a national law reinstating and making clear that the laws of the United States recognize individuals' rights to privacy in the most intimate decisions that we make in our lives have got to be reinstated, and that would be one of my top priorities. And that's only gonna happen if we have a Democratic majority in Congress. If we rep if we elect a Republican to replace our current Congresswoman, we know that that person is going to be working to revoke the rights that we have here in the state of Washington. And people are going to find themselves traveling farther and farther to save their lives. Ms. Danimus. I take a no excuses approach to this issue. There's this great country western song, or maybe it's rockabilly, I don't know. Don't give me no lines and keep your hands to yourself. Does anybody remember that? I mean, this affects uh, reproductive rights, trans issues, rape, inappropriate touching. Um, you know, it, it's inspiring to me when I talk to younger people because they're, I remember as a kid, well, Give your Uncle Tom a hug. You know, I didn't want to give Uncle Tom a hug, but we used to push children to do that. You know, give Grandma a kiss. Mm, you, know. you know, I mean, the body autonomy needs to be absolutely respected in every single area, no matter what. You may not touch me without my consent. You may not, you must not restrict my choices of what I do with my body. Informed consent is a neighbor to this. I don't disagree with Carmela with regards to the privacy issues. That was the original foundation um, of Roe v. Wade. But also to informed consent is a huge issue. There are all kinds of things being put in our bodies and knee implants and breast implants, a mesh, you know, you're always seeing these uh, you know, group lawsuits um, against these things because they're allowed to lie to us. So how can you consent to what's happening to your body if you don't have all of the information? It's a neighboring issue to this. So strengthening informed consent. I actually have a friend named Heather who's dying from mesh right now. She survived breast cancer and now is dying because they did not 
fully inform her about what they were putting in her body and she is now dying. So body autonomy and informed consent go hand in hand and we need to solidify this, codify it to where no one can tell you or touch you without your permission, no excuses, and no one can interfere with the decisions that you make about your own body. Dr. Bank. Um, probably a lot in this room heard uh, in August of 2023 that the Vanderbilt University Transgender Clinic released records to the state of Tennessee without consent. I mean, how long have we been hearing about HIPAA? Privacy, 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 right? This is the trend, right? And we, we need to take that back. As far as the general topic of bodily autonomy and women go, on June 24th of 2022, the Supreme Court of the United States overturned Roe v. Wade with the Dobbs decision. This has been devastating for women and their families. Women's health is family health. Men and children are also suffering the consequences of Dobbs. I have a friend that does locum tenens. She goes to other states and, and fills in when providers are out. She was in North Dakota before Christmas and a woman who was 18 weeks pregnant came in. Ruptured membranes, tender uterus, white count going up. The, the patient decided she did not want to continue the pregnancy. But now in North Dakota, instead of you know, going along with those decisions, my friend had to call another provider. The other provider said, oh, um, I can't sign off on that unless she's septic or in the ICU. So is she either of those? No, she's not. Okay, we got to try and transfer this patient out then. So through a long process, uh, the patient finally ended up getting up to Minneapolis, a 10-hour drive for the husband. The husband said, this is crazy. Why is this happening to my wife? Why is this happening to his wife? She did ultimately get care, but it took a long time of call, phone calls and, and hassles to get that care. This is happening over and over and over in our country. Each woman needs the freedom to decide if and when they want to start a family. This is a very personal decision and no one should be else should be making this choice for women. I would not have wanted someone else to make that decision for me, and I certainly cannot make those decisions for anyone else. Now some states are trying to ban contraception too. These draconian restrictions are, are causing providers to flee these states. Already right next door in Idaho, one third of the obstetrician gynecologists have left the state. Many labor and delivery units have closed and because it's a due to a lack of provider care. Women in Sandpoint not only can't get maternity care now, they can't get gynecology care either. The decline in women's health is the biggest human rights concern of our times, adversely affecting more Americans than any other issue. Until all women in the United States have autonomy over their own bodies, women are second-class citizens. Like France, we need to enshrine reproductive freedom in our Constitution once and for all. Thank you, Dr. Mink. Ms. Conroy, anything to add? Just briefly, uh, it's a good reminder that as Bernie went through some, of the, some recent examples of doctors closing their practices, patients having to be sicker or closer to death before they can be treated, um, these are all happening under the banner of states' rights. And we need to remember that since the Civil War all the way up through today, especially since Dodds, anybody, most people using states' rights, um, if it's res with respect to bodily autonomy or health care, what they're talking about is the right to discriminate amongst their citizens. And no state, any more than the federal government, should be able to discriminate amongst their ci citizens. It is just not, it's, it's wrong. Um, and the other argument that we've been hearing in these states is that the doctors just don't know what they're doing. They're not interpreting the law po the properly. Well. Let's reinstate a national law that says everybody's got a right to choice, and that will make those misunderstandings go away. Ms. Danimus? The last time we had a state's big states' rights issue about life and choice 
We had a civil war because some people felt it was okay to own human beings for their own economic gain. And I believe that that's what we're looking at right now. There's a tremendous trend. Yes, it's a minority, but it is a trend and the voices are getting louder and more ominous about where women fit in society and what we can tell them to do with their bodies. Um, this is not a pro-life by any stretch of the imagination. And I actually believe that pro-choice includes being able to choose to have a child because 26% of women already that have abortions already have children but are choosing to abort because they cannot afford another child. So we are pushing people into corners so they have no choice. My friend Brent is a married father of three because of abortion rights. Because had he not been able to make a decision on behalf of his wife, he would now be a widowed father of one. Thank you. Last word goes to you, Dr. Bank. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to circle back to this is an absolute assault on women. And uh, we, we definitely need to have reproductive freedom in this country, and uh, we need to take that right back uh, as soon as we possibly can. Thank you all. Um, as they say, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, this will be our last question. This comes from the Student Democrat Club. Given the ongoing challenges at the border, what specific policies do you propose to address the root causes of migration ensure border security, and manage the humanitarian aspects of the situation, starting with Ms. Nanimus. You know, this, there's a couple of things that we all agree on in this country. The first one is, is that we want to stop bad actors from crossing our borders. Uh, we want to stop the flow of illegal drugs, especially those that have proven to be so incredibly deadly, like fentanyl. And there's another thing that most of us agree on, is that the United States is a light. It is a beacon of freedom. And then unless you are a Native American, that we all have a history of immigration. And so this country needs to maintain its safety, but he also have to maintain our dignity. And that means having an immigration process that is safe, secure, and fair. Um, one of the issues that we're having with this surge, I do not believe it's a crisis. I think that the Republicans in part, Republican leaderships made it a crisis when they cut the border budget by 23% last March and then backed out of the bipartisan agreement that we had, which did not go far enough, but was certainly a start. We need more people. We need more resources. We also need another visa. H2A and H1B only provide for certain areas of employment. We have a tremendous amount of people that come to this country and work all kinds of jobs. The majority of them are working without paperwork because we do not have another kind of visa, kind of a miscellaneous visa. The other thing that we do, that we need to do, is we do have to let border control do their job. Um, what has been happening is when people cross the border, it used to be that they didn't want to get caught because you could not apply for asylum if you had crossed um, uh, without inspection, if you will. I do believe that we do need to go back to that because what's happening is that we're getting more bad actors crossing the border because they're able to kind of hide in the groups that are crossing for good reasons. Um, we also need to assist Mexico in protecting its southern border and its patrol of our northern border. 
So opening up opportunity, fully staffing and funding Border Patrol to make sure that we do have a path to citizenship and also shoring up our borders and our processes to keep this country safe and also maintain the beacon of light and the country of opportunity and freedom. Dr. Bank. Thank you. So those H-2A migratory workers are essential for this district. Our farmers depend on those workers, and we do not want to do anything that's going to decrease those workers coming to our area. We need them, and I think everybody needs to acknowledge how much we depend on them, and the farmers will be the first to tell you that. Um, as far as uh, the border, um, again, I'm not an expert on, on immigration, but it seemed pretty clear to me that this recent border bill was going to give us a lot of the uh, tools that we needed to decrease this uh, asylum processing from six years down to six weeks. We were gonna have more judges, we were gonna have more border patrol agents, and we were gonna have more people to process the asylum seekers. So it was really disappointing to see that go down in flames, and I really would push to get those back on the table and, and get that passed uh, with, with the, that kind of support. Um, I, I think that uh, there cer certainly are um, other things that need to be addressed. I would really like to see DACA recipients have a pathway to citizenship in this country. I think that's shameful that we don't have that. Um, and I also think that um, we have created some of these situations in South America and <clears throat> in uh, other, other regions south of the border. We have not always been a fair player and we have created some, some governments that have led to some of these problems. So I do think there is room, a lot of room for di diplomacy and financial support on the part of the United States to make up for some of those past uh, discretions. Ms. Conroy. Tim, I'm gonna have to ask you for what the third question was. I love three-part questions, but I heard root causes, border security, and? Uh, manage the humanitarian aspects of the situation. Okay, great, thank you. So the root causes of immigration, um, they're push factors as well as pull factors. The pull factors are that we have the strongest economy in the developed world today, and we have a need for labor. And so we want people to come to our country to work and do the essential jobs that we need to have filled. And people know that. And so we've got pull factors inviting people to come, and we want them to come. The push factor that we have is that there's a climate emergency going on worldwide. And so there are people who used to be able to farm in their own country. They used to be able to fish on their own island home. And those homes are disappearing. And that's happening on the fringes of the United States as well as in other countries as well. People are being pushed away from their homes to safer spaces where they have survivable climates. We've got, um, you know, miles of Louisiana coastland disappearing every day, um, as well as Native Alaskan communities no longer able to live in their traditional homelands because they've no longer got permafrost. With respect to border security, as, as my colleagues have stated, um, there was a bipartisan border bill, one of the, the toughest bills in years uh, that was presented by Rep, uh, Senator Jim Lankford of Oklahoma, and the House and Senate Republicans decided they weren't going to go with that because uh, their cult leader told them not to. So if anybody says that anybody tries to claim that the border crisis is somehow the result of the Democrats in Congress or a Democratic administration, no. It's because there's somebody who wants to lead the United States who would rather preserve a problem as a political tool than solve a problem, and that's just wrong. Then finally, with respect to the humanitarian assets, uh, humanitarian aspects of this issue, it is a, a terrible situation because of the lack of staffing and because of laws, uh, the lack of laws that, that keep up with um, America's needs for people, 
We can't get people that we want to come in as quickly as we want them to come, as quickly as we can. And we can't turf people out as quickly as we want them out because we don't have the people and we don't have the systems in place to be able to make those assessments quickly and efficiently and let people get on with their lives. And that's what Congress can do. We hold the purse strings. It's a matter of getting in there, working across the aisle, and making sure that city folks, rural folks, all folks get the, the decisions that we need to be able to move on and, and make our economy inclusive and getting back to work for all of us. Thank you. Anything to add, Ms. Animus? Yes. Um, I think on this issue in particular, um, the GOP has, I mean, all due respect to Carmela, th there is no working across the aisle on this issue. Um, but I do think that, as I mentioned before, we can work across the street. When I speak to Republicans, what they say to me foundationally is have them come legally. And then when you start to explain to them how the system has broken down in essence, at least uh, more moderate Republicans who like to have conversations about things, um, they start to understand. I mean, certainly everything that we've talked about today, they are complex issues, but we have seen a breakdown in government. Government is not governing anymore. It's like 535 Instagram models arguing about things. This issue has been caught up in rhetoric. And again, rhetoric is adversely affecting people's lives. The only way that I believe that we can maintain um, that beacon and to ensure humanitarian treatment, to make sure that we are opening paths, not only to citizenship, but also to fulfill the seven million uh, jobs that we have available, is to make sure that Democrats are leading on this issue. I feel that the GOP in this area, at least leadership, is completely useless. Dr. Bank, anything to add? No, thank you. Ms. Conroy? No, thank you. Okay. With that, that was our last question. Uh, all three candidates will have five minutes to speak freely. Before that, I'd like to thank all three candidates for coming. Uh, also, I also, as a moderate, first time moderator, appreciate uh, everyone kind of sticking with the rules. And just a reminder, uh, in your final uh, statements, no fundraising, no encouraging people to get on your website or anything along those lines. Um, when with that, we'll start with uh, Dr. Bank, you have five minutes. Thank you, and I just wanna say uh, thank you to the Eastern Washington University Democrats for hosting this. What a fantastic event, and I just feel very fortunate to have been included. Kira Condon, Stephen McRae, well done, well done. <laughs> It is clear that uh, this now being an open seat, uh, the area is really energized about this election. I uh, really, until Dobbs, didn't feel like I had uh, a strong enough reason to do what I'm doing now. This is a lot of work and a lot of time. And a lot of you that have been on these campaigns before understand that. But it is so worth it. And I do look at the college students and younger women and younger men, and I think that's the reason I'm doing this. That's the future. Those are the people who are really going to have the, the biggest consequences and the longest term consequences from a lot of these decisions that are being made, particularly against women. But like I said, it affects men too. I started the gynecology department at the Spokane VA. And I really am proud of that experience. I ran that clinic for five years. So veterans are near and dear to my heart. And I really feel it's important to continue to support veterans because they signed up and put their lives on the line for us. We owe them. We promised them they would get good health care, and they deserve that. And we need to follow up on that, and we need to make sure they continue to get good health care. Uh, the VA system is a, a fascinating organization because it is the largest healthcare provider in the world. I mean, it is a juggernaut. 
And in part, you know, what comes along with that is the fact that the VA can negotiate pretty dang good low rates for prescription medications because they are negotiating on such a large scale. So there are things we can learn from the VA. Uh, veterans have an over 80% approval of, of the healthcare system and the help that they get. And that's pretty impressive. And a lot of studies have shown that the outcomes are actually better in the VA system than in the private sector. So I would just say uh, for, for my issues, yes, health, women's health care is my primary issue. Uh, veterans health care is huge for me. I definitely want to see uh, more infrastructure come into the area. I would like to see us tapping into some of that 1.3 trillion infrastructure bill to bring passenger rail back to this area in a bigger way. Uh, I would love to see um, the light uh, rail line that was kind of in, uh, being talked about 20 years ago. I would love to see that come back up from Spokane Airport out to Coeur d'Alene. I'd love to see passenger rail from uh, Spokane up to the Canadian border. And there's so many other things in this region that we really need to be addressing. Let's talk about the four over uh, chemicals and PFAS out in Airway Heights. We are just now learning about that. And we're learning that 50% of those wells are contaminated. And those people have drinking, been drinking that water for years. Uh, we need to make sure we are doing anything and everything we can to be proactive from this point forward uh, in terms of, of keeping things uh, a little safer for our communities. And we're gonna see that spread throughout the country because these are those uh, fire extinguisher foams that came off of both Fairchild Air Force uh, Base as well as the Spokane Airport. And we've got a lot of military bases in this country and we've got a lot of airports. So it is, and Deer Park is already testing positive. So again, I just wanna thank everyone for being here today. This has been a wonderful experience for me and I really appreciate both Carmela and Anne-Marie. I think they're so, in so intelligent. Thank you. And I'll, I'll leave it at that, thank you. Okay, Ms. Conroy. Thank you. I too would like to thank the EWU Student Democrats, Steve McRae and, and Kira, it's fantastic that you're hosting this. I know that it's a lot of work to advertise and reserve the rooms and get everybody lined up and set up fair rules. So thank you for that. And please, um, having run a local party organization, I know that it takes time and money. So I'm gonna write a check to the EW Student Democrats on my way out the door and I hope everybody else here who can afford to do that will do the same. Uh, I, you know, sort of had a, a great existence growing up in the valley. Um, my, my mom and dad grew up in the area. My grandparents grew up in the area. We had aunts and uncles and cousins and good schools and kids and dogs ran around free range and nobody really gave any thought to who was in charge of the government. Uh, we paid our taxes, we voted, um, it was my, my parents raised all of us to believe that we should participate, we should take care of our community, we should look after one another, and all of us are we created equal. And I went into government and public service without much thought at all about which party was in charge because my experience both at the Spokane County Prosecutor's Office as well as with the State Department when I started all the way back in 1996, was that it didn't really matter who was in the White House. I was still going to be able to uphold my oath to, to defend the Constitution from enemies domestic and foreign, and that regardless of whether the President of the United States was, an Ameri was a Democrat or a Republican, they were focused on the same goals. Um, that in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and preserve the blessings of liberty, not just for ourselves, but for future generations, is something that both parties work toward. They just had different ideas about how to get there. 
But that's gonna be true anytime you've got more than two people thinking about how to solve a problem. So it didn't, it didn't bother me, it didn't concern me that there were two different parties uh, with two different ideas about how to get to the same goal. We are in a different situation, um, have been since about 2017. And I watched that from inside the federal government. There have been countries where I've worked where persuading politicians to do the right thing meant that we had to point out to them very explicitly how they personally and their families would benefit from a change from the status quo. And sometimes when I went back to Washington, D.C., I'd have, you know, we'd, we'd have desk officers who'd say, well, why don't they understand that doing this for their people would be great for all of their people, for the entire population they represent? And I'd say, well, it's not the way we think about it in the United States. They're used to thinking about it in terms of what's in it for them specifically, what's in it for their family specifically, what's in it for their specific religious sect. That's how it works in their world. And we haven't experienced that here in the States. Well, we are experiencing that now. There are extremists in the Republican Party who only want things to work if it works for them specifically. They only want it if they personally are going to be able to pocket a benefit and they don't care the impact that it has on the rest of us. They want to control women. They want to keep people who are not of a particular sect of Christianity from having freedom of religion. And that's not what I signed up for when I swore the oath to uphold the Constitution and defend it from enemies foreign and domestic. I am running for Congress because I believe that we are at a really important turning point in our nation's life and making sure that we, can't be, that we continue working towards our aspiration of being an, a democracy that works for everybody, an inclusive economy where everybody gets equal access regardless of race or gender or religion. That's what we should all be working for, and that's what I want to get back to. And I hope to represent you all in Congress starting next year. Thank you, Ms. Conroy. Ms. Danimus. Thank you. Clean air, clean water, an affordable education, not avoiding the doctor because you can't pay the bill, going out for a job and knowing that you're going to be able to pay your rent and put food on the table, buy your kids new shoes for the upcoming school year. That's the American dream, isn't it? I mean, just to be able to exist, to be able to have some time then to go out to dinner without checking your bank account, to be able to have a vacation. Now, I've never had a vacation, I don't think, where we didn't pack sandwiches because, you know, that was the income level that I grew up on. But you know, my campaign is about a vision of prosperity for everyone, leaving no one behind. And the rights that we have in this country to be able to pursue those opportunities have been stymied because we have no bargaining power. And this race is more about it is less about how all of us agree. It's about people in this district who have traditionally voted Republican. And when we talk about kitchen table issues and they talk about hearkening back, you know, certainly there's racism out there, certainly there's issues with regards to women's rights, but I do believe the majority of people remember what it was like to have that level of security, the kitchen table issues that are affecting everyone. Israel and Palestine is a huge issue. Our border, that's a very big issue. These issues that are presented today are going to change 
in a year or two, hopefully those two things will be resolved peacefully, but there will be another issue. But in order to bring people together, we have to give them the safety, the security, and we have to give them the American dream back. When the Russians put up Sputnik, we said, I'll see your Sputnik and raise you a Neil Armstrong. And we won the space race. And we did that with all Americans pitching in with a communal idea of what it meant to be an American, to aim high and to strive. And we weren't being sold out. I wear this penny that stands for nope, not one penny ever of corporate money. And we're only gonna get there one candidate at a time. What's keeping us for the American dream, what is keeping us is I don't believe per se that it's extremists. It's the people that are in it for the money that allow the extremists to do what they do so they can stay in power, so they can stay cashing that paycheck. It is time to eliminate corporate influence in Congress. It is the number one thing that affects us. When you send me to Congress, you'll know that I'm going to be fighting for health care for you. I'm not there for Medicare. When you send me to Congress, it's not about Amazon or Exxon or Walmart or Cargill. One of the biggest... Uh, farming, uh, manufactured farming companies in the entire world. I will be there for you because I don't just want to flip this district. I want to clean it up and I want to bring it back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So after this, all three candidates will be available to speak to you directly, uh, off stage, of course. Uh, before that, though, let's hear it one more time for the student Democrats and the candidates, please. Thank you. 